Right, this video is about solving kinetics problems with uh, non-linear regression. Now you can implement this in various ways. This is going to be with a spreadsheet, but the maths is kind of generalizable and you could code it up in whatever you like. So let's have a look at how you would do it, uh, say from lecture notes for a moment. Um, say you've got this data, you've got time, and you've got a concentration, and that's maybe a product disappearing to become, um, sorry, a reactant becoming a product. You get these characteristic curves. And the way you would do this conventionally is that you uh, take advantage of the fact that the first order rate law can become a linear graph really easily. Um, the rate is equal to Ka. You integrate that to get a characteristic plot of what concentration should be, and it's an exponential curve, then you take the log of that to linearize it. And that's what we're gonna do here. Let's take A and we type in equals ln for natural log of A. Turn that, shoot it down. For some reason, this has gone into percentage, so let's just get rid of that. And then we can chart these numbers, insert a single graph, and it's a straight line add the trend line, add in the equation, and we can see that the rate constant here is 0 0.35. We can do some more linear regression stuff. We can get that out with the slope function if we wanted to. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, that works. Um, but sometimes real data is a bit more messy. And sometimes things can be a lot more complicated. We're not just going from A to B. So let's have a look at this data, for instance. Now I've got uh, A and B, but let's plot this and see if there is a slight difference. Let me... You can see these are not going to completion. In fact, these are going to about, maybe this is settling off at about 10 or 11 and this is going to go into 45 so maybe about 80 percent completion this is going to and now that is an indication that the equal there's an equilibrium being formed we've got a rate constant going from a to b uh, that's forming the product and then b to a going back so we've actually got two rate constants to solve and it's not immediately obvious how to do that from this data so what we're going to do is set up a simulation and then optimize that simulation and match it to the data. So this is gonna be a little bit involved, um, but stick with me, we will um, cover the maths quite slowly now. Right, so that's the linear method. It really requires um, only kind of special data. So let's have a look at the nonlinear method. And this requires kind of making a bit more of an assumption about what this d by dt means. So what we're going to say is d a by dt. What does that actually mean in terms of the calculus? Well, it actually means a certain amount of change in your y divided by a certain amount of change in your x direction and the d by d terminology means it's a limit so we're actually going to be a bit more specific about that and explicit and get rid of that negative for now we don't really need it we're going to say that concentration of a at um, some time plus what we're going to call delta t some time interval minus that same concentration at time t. So yeah, that's what d uh, a means. Uh, and if you're familiar with your calculus, and this should not be too out there, this is this is exactly what this symbol here on the left means. It just means that delta t approaches zero, it becomes this. And we're going to stick at the bottom delta t. So some time interval. And that is still equal to the same thing as before. K times the concentration of A. 
and I'm going to be very explicit and just say that it is at time t. So at a particular time, ooh, the concentration is this, the rate constant is this, the concentration is this. And then in a future time, the concentration is here, and that future time is determined by that step, delta t. Now we just need to do a little bit of rearrangement. We're going to send the delta t to the, si uh, the other side. And it's going to take a little while to write out because I've insisted again on using multiple colours for this, but it keeps track of everything. Uh, times all in purple, the concentrations in red there. Um, so we brought that to the other side, and this actually makes some sense now um, because what we have is a rate constant, which first order rate constant will be in uh, per second. dt will be in seconds, and this is going to be in concentration. So what we've got here is a unit of concentration. Now what we'd be left with if we move this is this here, so we can rearrange this to the other side. So we're going to plus the concentration at time t. which is in molar. So now these units are all compatible with each other. The per second and the seconds cancel out because we've got a rate constant in per second multiplied by a time step. Uh, and that leaves molar from this and molar here. So those are compatible. And what they'll give us is if we rearrange it, it's time. Give me plenty of space to actually write this. It, this will be the concentration at time t plus delta t. So this is what we're going to do. We've actually kind of simplified things a little bit. And this is what we're going to do to build a simulation. So I'm going to go back to our spreadsheet and start building a simulation using that equation. So I'm going to give myself plenty of space over here. I'm going to write time a but you could label these as predicted if you want, um, but it's not entirely necessary at this stage. So we're going to start at time zero, and we need to figure out a prediction for these. We'll come to it in a second. Actually, let's. We know what time zero it's going to be. It's actually going to be that number and that number. And now we need to add a particular amount. Um, so actually, before we do that, I'm going to actually set up the variables properly because these are going to um, come into play. So we want a rate constant, uh, which we're going to call KAB. That's the forward rate constant. And I'm going to set up a backwards one called KBA. That means we're going backwards. We want a rate constant there. Uh, we also want uh, the starting concentration. Easier. We'll, we'll, we'll probably add this into the simulation later. We we can fiddle about with it. And we'll want B, 0. And also want delta T, which I'm going to put in as DT. Uh, and I'll make that as 0, 1. The starting concentration for B I'll make 0. The starting concentration for A will be 55. Uh, arbitrary units at this point. You would probably want to, we probably wouldn't get to 55 molar in reality, but it's. It's an arbitrary unit, and I'll stick these as one. And because it's Excel, I'm going to highlight all of these, go to uh, Formulas, Create from Selection, and in the left column. So I'm now going to have these values saved. So if I type in equals KAB, I get the KAB very constant. So now to build up the simulation, I'm going to add to the above time dt, which is that. So this is useful to do because I can just change this step if I wanted to. If I wanted to make it smaller in a more accurate um, um, more accurate simulation, I will make that smaller. Remember, 
this whole thing, this linear method, is actually the limit for when that time step hits zero. So the more accurate your, uh, so the smaller that time step, the more accurate your simulation will actually be. But you don't necessarily need it to be super small, just at least a tenth, maybe up to a hundredth of your um, overall time. I'm just going to keep zooming this down. I'm going to need a lot more rows. Oops, I've shot it down to about 14. It doesn't matter when it ends. It just matters that we've got it labeled correctly. I keep scroll up. Right, so there are my times. And now I'm going to fill in this. So I'm going to come back to the this for a moment and just talk a bit about the chemistry. So if we have A exchanging with B, going back and forward like that, um, then A is going to be produced by whatever this K B A raised constant is and it's going to be removed by whatever this K A B constant is. So if you look back on here, we know the change is k, the rate constant, multiplied by the concentration, multiplied by the time step. So, concentration of a, and we'll keep it colored, why not? At time uh, t plus delta t, it's going to be equal to its concentration at time t. And it's going to be increased. So I'm going to plus. I'm just going to put these on different lines, but it's it's all being added together. It's going to be increased by KBA. That's this equal uh, this rate constant going backwards times by the concentration of B, because again B is having a first order reaction going in the other direction, exactly the same thing, multiplied by delta t. And A is going to be removed by the forward reaction. So we've got minus KAB, and that's going to be based on the concentration of A, because it is first order, again, times delta t. And this is where this method becomes really powerful because you can extend it as far as you like. A could be exchanging with B, it could be exchanging with C, it could be exchanging with D. It could have all sorts of equilibria going in and out of it. Um, you just bolt that on here. As long as it's roughly first order or pseudo first order going in and out, uh, you just bolt on another piece that looks like that. And that's fantastic. That means this can go as complicated as you like. You can have as many things exchanging as you like. Just bolt another one of those on to take it into account. So let's actually implement that. So I'm going to remove these just for a moment and replace them with equals a zero and b zero. So I'm only going to fiddle with these. In fact, I'm going to highlight these as um, let's set the cells on. Let's change them to input styles. So, what's this next time step going to be? Well, I'm going to make equals, and it is going to be uh, the previous one, previous concentration at t, and we're going to plus kba. Fantastic, because we labeled them up. It starts, the Excel file starts to look like equations. You don't have to start dealing with cells or anything like that. Multiplied by uh, the concentration of B. Well, it's going to be that one there, because that's the concentration. There's no B there, so this is actually not going to add anything. Multiplied by DT, our time step. And for some reason, yes, again, percentages. Why did it switch to that? We could shoot that down in no change because there is no B here. If we change that to a one, ah, look, it drops down. But it's also going to be 
minus something. So it's going to minus Kab. That's the forward reaction that's removing A, multiplied by the concentration of A, the previous time step, multiplied by dt, our time step there. And what we've got there is, let's actually just plot that very quickly. We've got that neat exponential curve, or roughly exponential curve, that we'd expect from a first order reaction. But it is going to completion, and the reason it's going to completion is because the concentration of B remains zero. So we're going to have to add B to this now. It's exactly the same as before. We're going to figure out what's going to change to B. Well, we're going to start with the previous one. And what creates B? Well, it's going to be KAB plus it multiplied by concentration of A, because that is generating B multiplied by a time step. And B is going to be removed by its previous concentration multiplied by KBA, that's the backwards one, multiplied by DT. So you can see after the first step, there is a little bit of B present now because there was 55 uh, arbitrary units of A, and about a tenth of that is converted. Now we can shoot that down, and you can see how those numbers kind of briefly interacted with each other if you go back and see those change. Now, if we add this in, let's look at this. There we go. That is slightly different. Now, this is what you expect to see when things go to equilibrium. They don't quite finish. Um, let's just move this up to the top. Now, what happens if we double the rate constant that's going forward? We see the equilibrium begins to favor the product. If we set this to zero, uh, it goes completely to completion. If we set this one to be a bit higher, then it doesn't really go past 50%. And if we set these constants to be smaller, it's a slower reaction. And you can see kind of the ratio of those rate constants kind of determine your equilibrium constant as well. So that is the simulation that we're doing. The next part involves the actual uh, regression part of it. So very quickly, I'm going to delete that, and I'm going to add a new series to this so we can actually see both um, on here. So the series X values, uh, that's going to be all the way down here. Oops, that's the time. The y values are going to be all of this. So you can see that's our simulated product. In fact, let's name it simulated A. That's a simulated reaction. Add another one. This I'm going to add B. I'll move up. So we can actually now see these on the same graph. Uh, and because there's more data points here, these look a lot more continuous. But if we want to format this data series, we can actually change the marker options to B, no marker, but to add a line instead. Because that's, in theory, it's continuous. And what we could do is we could change delta t, that time step, to say 0 0.05. It would be a shorter simulation. We'd need to go back and add a few more rows, but it would be a more accurate simulation. So maybe I'll just leave it at 0 0.1 for now, because it's good enough. So now let's get back on to. nonlinear regression. What's that about? So if you look at linear regression or any kind of regression technique, it's based on the idea of fitting an ideal line 
to some data points. So let's imagine those dots are our data. And I'll stick with a straight line for now. And the straight line is our idealized uh, prediction. Well, what we need to do is we need to understand what's the difference between this point and the simulated point. We could measure all those distances. What is that distance between the line and the point? And we could add all of those up, except two problems. Uh, it doesn't necessarily weight it very well. And two, anything that's negative here will be compensated for by the positive ones. And we don't want to do that. So we take the point one. Let's call it y. Well, we subtract y prime, which would be, doesn't matter which way around, one of them represents the idealized line, the other one represents the data point. Literally, it doesn't matter which way around you get these. And you square it. That's why you don't, it doesn't matter, because it doesn't matter which way around you do this, this value will always end up as positive. And so you just sum them all up. Maybe you can whatever. So that would be the mass notation of it. And you want to minimize that. You change the parameters going into your simulation to minimize it. So let's set that up uh, now. So I'm going to move these over to one side for a moment. Uh, what I want is I want to do it entirely up here. I'm going to ignore this whole simulation off to one side for now. Um, we don't need to worry about it. So I want uh the value of a predicted or a pred i'll call it so we're going to add a v lookup to do this so you do v lookup uh x lookup if you're in the newest versions but i'll do v lookup for compatibility reasons and so what this is going to do is it's going to try and look up a value uh, which is going to be the time in a particular table. So I'm going to set that to our time and the table array is this one here. I know that goes down to 144 and it's the scroll, it doesn't enjoy scrolling very far when I'm uh, recording at the same time at the moment. And the important thing here is I'm going to have to set that to be locked using those dollar signs because um, I'm going to drag this down in a moment. And I don't want to move that table array so VLOOKUP is going to look up this number in blue and it's going to look down the leftmost column here. There are a couple of other ways of doing it, but I'll do VLOOKUP because it's quick. And it's going to return whichever column. So if I return if I type 1, it's going to return the first column. If I type uh, 2, it's going to return the other column. So let's uh, do that. I'm going to shoot it down. And there we go. Um, for some reason, if I type in false here for exact match, it stopped working. Um, so I don't know why it did that. So I'm just going to leave it as is. Uh, and what you can see is I'm returning these values now. So it's looked down for time equals 7. If I scroll down to time equals 7, 18.38. It's returned 18.38. Great, that's what we're after. I'm going to do the same for B, B predicted. Oops, don't need the equals there, do I? And I'm going to do the exact same thing. So I'm going to copy the formula, paste it in, and change that 2 to a 3 because I'm going to return the third column along. And you can see it returns 0, and it keeps increasing. So. Well, that will be that will remain the same even if I start changing this because I've done a V lookup it'll find a different point in the table but it will match the the correct time if I make this really fast it'll probably um, yeah the, it'll eventually break because I can't quite find them so you gotta make sure that it's at least returning something within the data you got there so now let's do that nonlinear regression thing. Let's find the difference between the predicted point and the actual point. So one minus the other. I'm going to wrap it in brackets. 
square it. So I can, I can even write it down there just to make sure I'm doing, doing it right. Um, and I want to do it for B as well. One minus the other. Yeah, remember to wrap it in brackets and square it. And all the numbers are positive. And then alt equals just to auto sum all of that. That's in the sum. And then I'm going to add in equals that plus this. I'm going to right click and define this name as a target. Okay, so let's set this as a an output. So what happens when this data fits? this number should go down. So I'm going to change my predicted equilibrium constant, uh, my rate constant. I think in general, they are going to be slower than that. You can see those thick blue lines, they're reaching equilibrium too quick. So I'm going to change that to 0 0.3 and 0 0.2. Mm, it's actually coming to more towards the, um, it's actually producing more products. So I'm going to lower that one. And what you can see is now that's a bit better fit, this has dropped to 180. And you can keep changing these numbers however you want. Uh, and it usually helps to get it roughly on for what the next step is. Because we're going to solve it by changing these numbers automatically. So I'm going to come to the data tab and I've already got it uh, set up and it's called solver. I think you can just write target there. And I want to change KAB, KBA, uh, what the hell, I'll do A0 and B0. Now you can also, if things get a bit more complicated, you can start adding constraints in. Uh, you add a constraint such that A plus B must equal a constant um, and it will work it within that range. So let's solve that churns through it and what you can see there's those two lines now fit through that data really really well and that that number's dropped from hundreds to 15. Uh, it would be really hard to fiddle with all of these data points and change it manually to fit so that's the basics of it we have to set up a simulation based on these constants the initial concentrations are optional. It's nice to let them um, be fiddled around with slightly to give you a little bit of flexibility, but it's not essential, especially if you know the starting concentration and you know that the other should be zero. Uh, it's more important to have these change, the two rate constants. And what you can see is KAB going forward is 0.25. KBA is 0 0.03 uh, and you see, can see according to this data it actually wouldn't necessarily hit equilibrium for another few more moments the data is it's still going up so maybe if you kept this going a little bit further you could refine it a bit more but that is it now how you do the errors on this and the uncertainties is a the whole other thing that will maybe will require another look at um, but this is the basic outline and the reason that this is really useful is you can very very literally do anything you like with it um, if you if you have let's say a and b and c interchanging with each other you just bolt it on the change in a it's going to be plus um, KBA times B plus KCA times C, all multiplied by delta T. And the same, th same thing will happen. You can do B, you can do C. You could set some of them to zero to say, oh, well, we're pretty sure that doesn't um, happen, so we're just going to deal with this. Or maybe we allow this to happen and see what the difference is. And you can just keep solving it. 
uh, so that is nonlinear regression and Excel. Why does it keep setting these things to percentages? I've so far never clicked that button. Um, that's it. Hope it becomes quite useful to people.